thunder rolled. It is said that the gods play games with the lives of men. But what games and why and the identities of the actual pawns and what the game is and what the rules are, who knows? Best not to speculate. Thunder rolled. It rolled a six. Nancy, you sunk my starship. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick. To pass the time up here in space, I invent special games for zero G using stuff that I find. Tic-tac toenails, pin the tail on myself, 3D spin the bottle. So imagine my delight when my earthbound pals in control faxed me up some comics in which the main character, Marlis, invents her own games to keep herself amused. The pages from Linda Berry's comic strip, Ernie Pook's Comic, are in her collection called Come Over, Come Over. Hi, Linda. It's Rick. Why does Marlis love to make up games like Beach Bingo? I think she's like what I wished I was like when I was a kid. Well, you know, where she just likes to have Marlis's, yeah, Beach Bingo, where you... Remember the, there was a car bingo that we used to play when we traveled? Which I could barely play because I got car sick really bad in the car, you know? But, um, Mar you know, so I just try to, but I remember my brothers being obsessed with that game. So I just try to recreate that, but do a really good version of it. Like Marlis's one at the beach is, you know, like seeing popsicle sticks, you know, sit sticking out of the ground. Or like a popsicle in the sand. Those are all these, like, little bingo things. Uh, like a, a really overweight lady standing in the, in the water just staring off. All the stuff that we really see at the beach, but you kind of forget that those, those, you could make those like a bingo game. Right. So I like doing that stuff. Why do you think that kids like those kind of games? God, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I just know they do. They sure do, too. I don't know why they like it. I mean, I still like it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't know, because I'm still playing. Right. Well, I thought you might be saying that kids often feel like they aren't in control of their own lives and that the games that they've invented are the one place where they at least know all the rules. And they can get a bingo. Yeah, I bet that's it. <laughs> Thanks. You just saved me 60 bucks in therapy. <laughs> I'll take you out. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Thanks, Linda. Now, Linda isn't the first writer to play with games. Lewis Carroll's fantasy story, Through the Looking Glass, involved a wild game of chess. Actually, chess is a lot like a fantasy story. I mean, you've got opposing forces, one light, one dark. There's conflict where pawns are sacrificed, knights battle, and castles fall. And it ends when the queen mates the king or The Bishop Meets the King, which I guess is more alternative fiction. A number of SF stories have featured chess. There's Midnight by the Morphe Watch by Fritz Leiber. Roger Zelazny's Unicorn Variations is based on an actual match played by two grandmasters back in 1901. And then, of course, there's Paul Anderson's classic story, The Immortal Game. What inspired The Immortal Game? Oh. Yeah, that was a chess story, of course. Well, but basically, it's just a chess game told from the viewpoint of one of the chessmen. If you look on man as a, basically a game-playing animal, I mean, that since we've long since pretty well solved the problem of providing the necessities of life for ourselves, we spend most of our time and attention playing games of one sort or another. This may be one reason why wars keep occurring again and again. Uh, 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 if you stop to think about it, war is the ultimate game uh, for very high stakes. And chess can symbolize war or the kinds of conflict. Um, and do it in a limited but 
very sharp way, uh, precisely uh, because the uh, it has these exact rules, right. which of course life doesn't. Re re real life is sloppy, but um, fic fic fiction doesn't portray real life anyway. It, it, it symbolizes it, and for some purposes, I think chess is uh, a convenient set of symbols. Several SF authors have built entire novels around the game of chess, but the only one that I know of who built a whole book around the specific moves of a particular game is John Brunner in The Squares of the City. Check, Nancy. I hit on the idea of adapting a real chess game move for move and seeing if I could disguise it as a novel. And it's just as well that I'm not a good chess player because I think it enabled me to bring it off in a way which somebody who was really skilled at the game would not have been able to. Because every time I made a move, I had to reanalyze the relationships between all the pieces. And as a result, I think I came up with as good a book as I was capable of writing at that time. And I felt very pleased with myself, and I felt very annoyed when I couldn't get the thing published. But in the end, it was published, and it made the shortlist for the Hugo Award. So the waiting, I won't say, was worthwhile, but it was justified in the long run. What do you mean, fool's mate? In Greg Bear's novel, Anvil of Stars, the human passengers on a starship teach chess to an alien species called the Brothers. These small, snake-like critters have limited intelligence until they intertwine to form a physically larger creature. Then the group is smarter than any one individual. Kind of the opposite of what happens with groups of humans. Why are a pacifist species like the Brothers so interested in a war game like chess? Well, they're fascinated by it because it's a zero-sum game. It's horrifying to them. There are no zero-sum games in their culture. You know, there are no winners and losers per se. At least they tell us this. Later on, I think one of them admits that they have had wars in their past of which they are deeply ashamed. But uh, chess is an analogy of war. And so they, they think of this as another human uh, aberration. Um, uh, they're fascinated by it, however, because it is, in fact, perfectly rational and limited. And uh, maybe they come across it as a kind of drug. I don't actually get into this too much in the book because it, it's just really it's kind of a throwaway thing uh, where they in fact become very good at playing chess, but only on the basic level of when they've broken down into their component parts. Mm -hmm. These component parts are then very good at playing chess uh, because they kind of lobotomize their social consciousness. The game actually kills one of them. Yes, it's so intense an experience that it just kills them. <laughs> but I felt that way playing a game of chess too. I'm sure we all have against a good player. It's, you just want to die because you can't do anything. You're, right. you're locked into a, a bad position. Chess can add a whole new dimension to a science fiction story, but on Star Trek, they added a whole new dimension to chess, 3D chess. Actually, I guess it was 4D chess, because playing a game took a really long time. In Star Trek The Next Generation, the game of choice is poker. Remember the game on the holodeck between Albert Einstein, Sir Isaac Newton, and Stephen Hawking? Poker also appears in The Big Game, which is the first Star Trek Deep Space Nine novel by Sandy Schofield. Let's call up Sandy's feminine side. Sandy Schofield is a pseudonym for the writing team of Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush. Hi, Chris, it's the Commander. How did poker end up playing such a large role in your Deep Space Nine novel? 